All right. If you're just joining us, welcome to the webinar today. If you don't mind opening up your chat box and saying hello where you're logging in from, we are going to get started in just a little bit. Thanks so much for attending. All right, good morning, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the classroom today. I am so excited to connect with each and every one of you. So if you just joined us, go ahead and in the chat box, say hello, where you're logging in from. We got Subani from New York, Jamie from Rootstown. We have people from Guyana, Maya, awesome, very good. We have Greek islands. What an international audience. We are also live streaming on YouTube. So please check out that link as well. Excellent. Well, everyone, I am so excited to spend the next hour and 15 minutes covering pharmacology. As many of you know, in the past few weeks, we have been crushing the NBME top concepts outline and today we're going to do a little bit of a spin. We're going to be covering microbiology and antibiotics in a very integrative way. So I really thank you guys for joining me. For many of you, this may be the first time you are attending one of these webinars, and I welcome you to this high energy review. And if you've joined my prior webinars, 
I also welcome you back. My name is Rahul. I'm currently a second year pediatric critical care fellow. And over the past six years, I have been absolutely passionate about helping students just like you excel and apply concepts for the USMLE exams. This is going to be a very, very special webinar. And before I get into the specific content points of the webinar, I want to just spend a few minutes going through what makes my baby, Hi Guru, so unique. We are the only company out there that focuses on active recall. We focus on integration of material. And most importantly, we focus on test taking strategy. Studying the theory is one thing, but applying the content to vignette style questions is another. And I have created a systematic approach on how I go through a question. How do I go through various types of questions? Those EKG questions, multimedia questions. How do I even go through a whole block? How do you balance timing? I am very excited to also share with you the triad of USMLE preparation, which I use to prepare students one-on-one, -on -one, that I use to prepare students at various medical schools. It focuses on content application and test taking strategy, making sure that you have a peak mindset while you're going through dedicated, staying positive, and finally, utilizing a very unique program notion to make sure that you're scheduling and tracking your progress. But I think most importantly, and as many of you know, we have over 200 people joining us today. Most importantly, Hi Guru is a community, a lifelong community of learners. I've been absolutely passionate about helping students from not only the states, but all around the world excel and really get the score that they want for the USMLE. In the age of COVID and in the age of Zoom, we've really transformed into a global community. And I really thank you for being a part of it. One of the key things that I'm going to be highlighting today, everyone, is the fact that this webinar is so, so special because it is a little bit of a pump up session for my May webinar, which is going to be going through pharmacology over two days. It's going to be a step one rapid review. And what inspired me to create the pharmacology rapid review course is Two things. Number one, pharmacology is about 16 to 23% of the USMLE step one. I mean, come on, these are easy points. And in the November 2020 bulletin released by the step one, there was an announcement that says that now you're going to see less next best step in management questions on step one and more a focus on drug mechanisms. And so May 15th and May 16th, just coming up next month, this course is going to integrate pathophysiology and pharmacology together. And I encourage you to stay until the end of this webinar today to get the details of this course. I'm going to go ahead and just link the curriculum and the sign up into the chat box. And subsequently, we will be doing a little Q&A at the end. But today, I want to go through antimicrobials the way that I'm going to be going through cardiology pharmacology, respiratory pharmacology, endocrine pharmacology, the way that I'll be going through pharmacology during our May session. So how I encourage you to go through pharmacology is the following way. I have created this reverse pyramid model, and I want to encourage you to use this while you're studying pharmacology. What I first do is I'm going to start today with the pathology and pathophysiology. And then what I'm going to do is relate it to the big picture, the class effect. What do all of the medications do? Subsequently, I'm also going to be integrating the mechanism of action of the class of medications we are going to be talking about and also going back and forth, relating it to the pathology and pathophysiology. Finally, we'll get into the specific names, the actual drug names that you need to know, 
and then the relevant side effects, which come up on the USMLE. Again, the focus here is going to be how can I apply the concepts? And most importantly, how can I study pharmacology and pathophysiology at the same time? So let's go ahead and take an example. For example, today we're going to be talking about gram positive bacteria, staph, and strep. They cause your skin and soft tissue infections. And what the big picture of the antimicrobials that cover staph and strep is that they inhibit the cell wall of the bacteria. Specifically, what these penicillin agents do is they bind penicillin binding protein, which is going to be a transpeptidase, and they inhibit the cross-linking of the cell wall. Well, what are going to be the specific agents? Well, these are your beta-lactam medications, your penicillins, as well as derivatives, cephalosporins, which have the beta-lactam ring. And then finally, many of these penicillins cause hypersensitivity. Just to relate it to immunology, everyone, type 1 hypersensitivity, it's related to IgE. And they can cause interstitial nephritis, which on your USMLE, presents as a patient who has worsening kidney function and eosinophils in the urine. So this is just going to be a little bit of a flavor as to how we are going to be going through antimicrobials. So before I get started, I want you guys to, first off, cut out all distractions for the next hour and 15 minutes. Put away your phone, put away all those other tabs, just focus with me because I promise you that this material is so high yield, so integrative and very USMLE focused. And if you're struggling with antibiotics, here's going to be a fresh perspective. Before I get started though, I wanna make sure that you have energy and your study space right now. Go ahead and type in yes into the chat box if you're ready to get started. Minnie's ready, Andrew's ready, Brian, Alex, Natalie, Toda, Kieran, Alex, Maya, Dominic, wow. I am very excited to go through this review with you. So let's first go through the big picture. Today, the big picture points that we're going to be covering is the fact that here's a bacteria and bacteria obviously have cell membranes and a cell wall. And that cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan. And remember, the US Assembly wants you to know that gram-positive bacteria have a very thick peptidoglycan wall. And one of the classes of antibiotics that we use are called the beta-lactams, and they inhibit the bacterial cell wall synthesis. Subsequently, bacteria have DNA that then replicate. The DNA then gets transcribed into mRNA, and then finally, you are going to get protein. And so we have antibiotics that affect protein synthesis, and that's going to be the second portion of our webinar. So first thing that we're going to do is we're going to be covering the agents that inhibit the peptidoglycan synthesis. And those agents are going to be beta-lactams. Let's go ahead and start warm up today with a question. An experiment is noted to affect gram-positive organisms. It is found that an antibiotic which inhibits a cell structural component is prescribed. Once the antibiotic is given, the bacteria are noted to swell and die when placed in a hypotonic solution. Which of the following best describes the mechanism of action of the antibiotic? A, disruption of GNA gyrase. B, altering of ribosomal assembly. C, disruption of transpeptidation of cell wall. Or D, free radical DNA damage. Go ahead and put this into the chat. And these are one of those experimental questions, which are going to be very high yield for the USMLA. All right. I'm seeing a lot of C within the chat box, and you're absolutely correct. Again, I encourage you open up the chat box and participate because when you type it in during this high intensity active recall webinar, you're going to have a higher likelihood to actually remember what you're typing and remember the content. So Remember that if you are going to have an antibiotic that is going to essentially affect the cell wall, when you place that bacteria 
in a hypotonic solution, after the cell wall is gone, the free water will go into the actual bacteria itself and cause the bacteria to swell and subsequently die. So that makes us transition into this concept, and that is the peptidoglycan structure. Now, guys, go ahead and put into the chat, do gram positives have a thicker peptidoglycan structure or gram negatives? Go ahead and put that into the chat. A lot of people are saying gram positives, and you're absolutely correct. Remember that gram negative bacteria have something called endotoxin lipopolysaccharide. We're going to get into that a little bit later on in this webinar, but gram positive bacteria have that nice, thick peptidoglycan structure. And so many of the beta lactam medications, we call them penicillins, for example, many of the beta lactam medications are going to actually inhibit the cross-linking of the cell wall in the bacteria. And so specifically these beta lactams inhibit transpeptidation, which essentially makes the cell wall very, very strong. It has a similar homology to the Diala Diala subunit. And the big takeaway, the big picture guys for you is that beta lactams inhibit penicillin binding protein, transpeptidation, and subsequently bacterial cell wall cross-linking. So when we're talking about the cell wall, remember that that's the outer component that kind of maintains the cellular integrity. And we know from chapters one through three of Pathoma that if you are going to mess up the cellular integrity, i.e. the cell membrane, or in the case of bacteria, the cell wall, you are going to get irreversible cell injury, which can lead to cell death. And remember that there are four aspects of cell injury. You're going to be talking about mitochondrial damage and leakage of cytochrome C, which is going to activate caspases. Number two, you're going to be thinking about lysosomal leakage. And essentially that's going to corrode the actual, uh, or that's going to cause you to release those lysosomal enzymes that can chomp up the membrane. You can get nuclear damage, which is going to be an irreversible cell injury sign in which you get pycnosis, karyorexis, and karyolysis. And finally, you get membrane damage. So remember, beta-lactams inhibit transpeptidation, inhibit the cell membrane synthesis, and that causes membrane damage of bacteria. And if you get membrane damage, bam, that is an irreversible sign of cell injury, which can then lead to cell death. So let's go through beta-lactam antibiotics. Beta-lactam antibiotics, remember, they are primarily going to cover gram-positive. They do have some gram-negative effect, but beta-lactam antibiotics are primarily going to cover gram-positive bacteria. And the big picture is that they inhibit cell wall synthesis of the bacteria. They are going to specifically inhibit the transpeptidation reaction. And you see this in both penicillins as well as in cephalosporins. And both of them can cause hypersensitivity reactions as well as interstitial nephritis. So what we're first going to do is we're going to be covering the actual penicillins. And when I think about penicillins, I like to integrate it by starting small and then going broad. So what we'll first do is we'll cover penicillins. Then we will cover the beta lactamase sensitive penicillins the ones that get essentially nullified when the bacteria secrete penicillinase or beta-lactamase. We're going to be talking about beta-lactamase resistant penicillins. And then finally, we're going to be covering broad spectrum penicillins, which are your anti-pseudomonal penicillins. So this onion model, you got to keep very, very ingrained in your mind as we go through the subsequent slides. So what we'll first do is we'll talk about penicillins. Now, penicillins have been around forever. And what we need to know is that penicillins for your USMLA, they love to test the fact that they cover strep pyogenes and strep pneumonia. And remember that strep pyogenes is going to be a beta hemolytic streptococcus. It causes strep throat infections. And for example, strep pneumonia is going to cause you to have fever and focal lung findings on your chest x-ray or physical exam and that they are going to kind of allude to community-acquired pneumonia. The other thing that penicillins cover are some gram negatives. And in particular, you got to know that the penicillins can cover 
Neisseria meningitis. And then finally, just good old penicillin covers spirochetes like treponema pallidum. And I think that this one is the most high yield. Remember, you have penicillin G and penicillin V. Which one is oral? Go ahead and put that into the chat. If you're paying attention, you should be putting that immediately into the chat. And people know that penicillin V is going to be the oral form. You got it. All right, very good. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through some high yield vignettes related to penicillins. Let's first start with this one. A child presents with bronze coloring near the lips, nose, and mouth. Two weeks later, he has hematuria. So what are we worried about this? Bronze, bronze coloring. I'm also going to say that the buzzword is honey crusting. And you're thinking about group A streptococcus that causes impetigo. And remember that the key points for impetigo and group A strep in particular is the fact that group A strep is going to have the erythrogenic toxin, which is implicated in your staphylococcal uh, toxic shock syndrome. It has streptolysin. It has M protein, which is also a high yield virulence factor in what other USMLE vignette? Rheumatic fever. And what does M protein do? Well, M protein is going to prevent opsonization. And what are your two major opsonants? C3B and IgG. How about this one? A patient presents with fever and crackles in the right lung on exam. It is dull to percussion. So again, when you think about dullness to percussion in the lungs, you're going to be thinking of a consolidation. And so this is going to be the vignette for strep pneumonia. Strep pneumonia causes community-acquired pneumonia. And what are some key virulence factors? Well, the fact that strep pneumonia has a capsular polysaccharide and which patients are going to suffer if you are going to have a strep pneumo infection, that's going to be your sickle cell patients. Because remember, sickle cell patients are going to be functionally or anatomically asplenic. And thus, they are going to be susceptible to Bacteria, which have capsules, strep pneumo being one of them. And the US Emily loves for you to know that the spleen protects against encapsulated organisms. So no spleen, no protection against eight microbiological uh, diseases like strep pneumonia. Strep pneumonia also has an important virulence factor called the IgA protease. Now, just to go into the immunology portion of things, remember IgA coats the sinopulmonary surfaces, as well as the GI tract. And that's why patients on your USMLE who have IgA deficiency present in one of two ways. Number one, they are going to present as anaphylaxis to blood transfusions. And number two on the USMLE, they love for you to know that these patients with IgA deficiency present with recurrent Giardia infections, recurrent sinopulmonary infections. And so strep pneumonia has a virulence factor, IgA protease. And the U.S. Assembly wants you to know that the IgA antibody is a dimer. And this IgA protease is going to snip IgA at that J chain at that time. Subsequently, you are going to be thinking of this last vignette related to gram positives and penicillins. A patient with high risk factors for STI, say, for example, unprotected sexual intercourse or uh, some sort of contact mediated disease presents with a skin lesion that is non-painful. And they'll say that the skin lesion is going to be like a crater with heaped up edges. And remember, it's non-painful. And so this is going to be your treponema pallidum. And the USMLE loves for you to know that you're going to use dark field microscopy for treponema pallidum. Now, what are some key takeaways in terms of virulence factors? Well, the key thing for us to know is the pathophysiology. And that is that the spirochetes from syphilis invade and bind to the endothelial cells. And in particular, you can get an end arteritis or an inflammation of the small blood vessels. Now, this can be in the skin and that can cause you to have that painless chancre, but it can also be in the aorta. And you can destroy that vasovasorum. And the USMLE loves for you to know that that can then cause you to have a murmur 
heard best in the right second intercostal space that is going to be heard in diastole. And that's going to be your aortic regurgitation. So that is going to be key with penicillins, the strep tie-ins, as well as the tie-in with syphilis. The next portion that we're going to be going through is the beta-lactamase sensitive penicillins. Now, what does that mean? Remember, if this is going to be a bacteria that is going to infect you, that bacteria can actually secrete a beta-lactamase. And if your doctor prescribes you a penicillin, the beta-lactamase can actually cause you to have destruction of the beta-lactam ring and the penicillin or penicillin derivative will not work. So let's go through this concept a little bit more with a test question. A child presents with fever and runny nose. He is noted to have conjunctivitis and a decreased light reflex on exam in the right ear. So you're thinking about otitis media. What supports otitis media? Purulence is noted behind the right ear, tympanic membrane. Empiric treatment with amoxicillin is initiated. Three days later, the patient continues to have fever and worsening symptoms. Which of the following best describes the likely mechanism behind the patient's condition? A, increased bacterial inactivation of the beta-lactam ring. B, mutation in bacterial diala diala. C, abscess formation within the Oda canal, or D, lack of bioavailability within the tympanic membrane. What do you all think? Go ahead and put it into the chat. So he had an ear infection, he got amoxicillin, but now he, two days later, he continues to have symptoms. And you're absolutely correct. Whatever bacteria, most likely it's strep pneumo, Haemophilus or Moraxella, whatever bacteria is going to infect this child and causing the otitis media and conjunctivitis, likely this is going to be H flu. That is producing a beta lactamase, which is causing increased bacterial inactivation. And subsequently, it's causing your amoxicillin to not work as well. So, your beta lactamase sensitive penicillins are going to be amoxicillin and ampicillin. And essentially, if this is the beta-lactam ring, if the bacteria is going to secrete a beta-lactamase, well, then it changes the configuration and subsequently it causes your amoxicillin and ampicillin to not work. So that's an important virulence mechanism that many bacteria carry. The ones that are high yield are going to be, for example, your strep pneumonia, non-typable H flu, pasturella. These are going to be bacteria that have a high propensity to secrete beta-lactamase. All right. So when we think about amino penicillins, which is your amoxicillin and ampicillin, you're going to be thinking of gram positives such as listeria, and enterococcus. Remember that enterococcus likes bile and 6.5% very salty, salty conditions. Amino penicillins are going to be used in some gram negative infections. For example, H. pylori or E. coli, which causes urinary tract infections. Proteus, which is going to cause struvite stones. We talked about that in our renal NBME top concepts. And then salmonella and shigella, which are going to be two agents that cause bloody diarrhea. And what is important for us to know is that shigella actually requires a low infectious load. A lot of USMLE test uh, uh, practice exams cover that concept that you only need a few shigella bacteria to cause disease. Now, the other thing for us to recognize are the various vignettes that are going to be paired with these anti, uh, 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 with these, uh, excuse me, microbiological entities. Let's go through this one. A neonate who presents with irritability, decreased PO and hypothermia. Anytime you see a neonate who has, for example, temperature instability or is very irritable, you're gonna be thinking about neonatal sepsis. And one of the key agents 
that cause neonatal sepsis is listeria. What are some other ones? Hmm. Group B strep, listeria, E. coli. These are three high yield bugs that cause neonatal sepsis. Now remember, listeria is going to be a facultative anaerobic agent that is going to have that cool tumbling motility. And the key points related to Listeria that the USMLE wants you to know from a pathophysiology standpoint is that listeria forms these actin rockets and thus it goes from cell to cell without going into the extracellular environment. So it evades from the antibodies. What about this question? A patient with benign prostatic hyperplasia undergoes a GU procedure, which is the cystoscopy, and now has vegetation on the valve. What are you thinking of here? You're thinking of endocarditis, especially with the low grade fevers. You're thinking about a subacute bacterial endocarditis. And this is going to be related to enterococcus. And enterococcus, remember, like salt bile is a facultative anaerobe as well. And enterococcus can acquire the van gene, which is plasma encoded, and subsequently can change the peptidoglycan cell wall structure from not diala diala, but to diala dlac. And that is what causes vancomycin resistant enterococcus. We're going to re-review that at the end of the webinar, but you got to understand that enterococcus can actually cause you to have that change in the peptidoglycan diala diala mac uh, uh, structure. Another vignette that we're going to need to go through is this one. A patient presents with dysuria, positive leukocyte esterase, and positive nitrites on the urine analysis. What do you guys think is the disease that's going on here? Go ahead and put that into the chat. What is the disease that's going on when you have dysuria with positive LE and nitrites? You're absolutely correct, cystitis. And that is where we bring up E. coli. And we use these amino penicillins, amoxicillin, ampicillin for regular cystitis. And remember, one of the key virulence factors that E. coli has is this fimbriae. And the fimbriae bind to the urogenital epithelium. So as you have the urinary tract, and remember, the urinary tract as a histotion has what kind of epithelium? A transitional balloon like epithelium. The fimbriae of E. coli just bind like a finger to the urogenital tract and subsequently can cause you to have UTI. Now, remember the difference between just regular cystitis, which this is going to be a cystitis, and pyelonephritis is that pyelonephritis is infection of the kidney up here. And thus, patients are going to have systemic symptoms and costovertebral angle tenderness. So with these amino penicillins, if we notice that the bacteria in question produces penicillinase or beta-lactamase, you are going to use beta-lactamase inhibitors and couple them with, for example, your amino penicillins. So what are the different names of the beta-lactamase inhibitors? Well, the beta-lactamase inhibitors are going to be things like clavulinic acid, sulbactam, and tazobactam. I like the mnemonic CAST, C-A-S-T. So let's go ahead and go through a USMLA question. A patient is noted to be treated for otitis media with amoxicillin coupled with now clavulinic acid. What is the mechanism by which clavulinic acid increases the efficacy? And what clavulinic acid does is clavulinic acid decreases the amoxicillin cleavage by bacterial cells, which produce beta-lactamase. So now clavulinic acid is going to be a fighter against beta-lactamase, which is produced by the bacteria. So I want to make sure that you not only are prepared for the USMLE, but maybe even for your CEP2CK, as well as your actual uh, clinical rotations. And we use beta-lactam plus beta-lactamase inhibitors very commonly in the clinical setting. For example, amoxicillin with clavulinic acid, many of you probably know that that is augmentin. The IV form of augmentin is essentially ampicillin with sulbactam, and that's called unison. And this is an IV medication. And then we couple 
Piperacillin with tazobactam, again, IV medication. And that is what we call zosin. So this just gives you an idea of agents that we use very commonly in day-to-day clinical practice and it relate to this concept of beta-lactam with beta-lactamase inhibitors. So we use our ampicillin clavulinic acid, or sorry, ampicillin and sulbactam, as well as amoxclav. We use that for pasturella, otitis media, community-acquired pneumonia, sinusitis, as well as anaerobic organisms. Unison, for example, can be used for anaerobic infections. Zosin, we use for very broad spectrum antibiotic usage. And broad spectrum infections or broad spectrum antibiotics are going to be antibiotics that likely cover pseudomonas, which Zosin does, and MRSA, which vancomycin does. So a typical common routine that you'll see in the clinical setting is vancomycin and Zosin. Vancomycin to cover MRSA and Zosin to cover pseudomonas. So Piperacillin, tazobactam, it's one of those broad spectrum antibiotics. Let's go ahead and go through this question. A mother just gave birth to a full-term neonate. Two weeks postpartum, the patient, the mother, complains of tender, firm, swollen breasts. So sorry about the typo. This is supposed to say mother. The tenderness, the firmness, the swollen breast is primarily localized on the right nipple areola region. There's no fluctuance or purulence. Ultrasound is ordered and is unrevealing. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So a postpartum breastfeeding mother. A, inflammatory breast cancer. B, Paget's disease of the nipple. C, a breast abscess. D, mastitis. Or E, lobular carcinoma. And if you said D, you're absolutely correct. That mastitis is going to be typically caused by staph and is a superficial skin infection and inflammation of the breast parenchyma. And why it is not an abscess, it's because there's no purulence, there's no fluctuance, and the ultrasound doesn't show the abscess. And remember, abscesses histologically have the epithelial cell layer. So that brings us into the beta-lactamase resistant penicillins. Now, these penicillins are going to have a very large, large beta-lactam chain. And essentially, these beta-lactamase resistant penicillins are going to be your methicillin, your oxacillin, decloxacillin, and nafcillin. These penicillinase resistant or beta-lactamase resistant antibiotics have a very, very big side chain such that if a bacteria is going to secrete beta-lactamase and try to actually cut the, this uh, big, big antibiotic, this big side chain prevents your beta-lactamase from actually attacking the beta-lactam ring. And so the beta-lactamase resistant penicillins are going to be known as methicillin. And then I like to use the mnemonic NAF ox clocks, declox. NAF ox clocks, declox. So nafcillin, oxacillin, decloxacillin. And they primarily are going to be used for MSSA infections or gram positive infections. Now, which is the highest yield one, which I just tested on? That's going to be mastitis, which is caused by staph. And we use decloxacillin for mastitis. All right. A patient presents after having recurrent boils and skin abscesses. Anterior nares swab cultures are performed. The PCR of the swab reveals a pathogen that has an acquired MEK-A gene. What of the following or which of the following antibiotics will be most resistant to this gene alteration? A, cefazolin, B, clindamycin, C, doxycycline, D, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and E, vancomycin. 
We got a lot of different answers. When you're thinking about this question, think about this MECA gene. And what the MECA gene confers is going to be a penicillin binding protein resistance. And so you are going to be thinking of cefazolin as going to be the antibiotic that is going to be most resistant to this gene alteration. What's important for us to recognize is that cefazolin has a beta lactam moiety, just like penicillin. And so if you have a MECA gene alteration, you're going to have a penicillin binding protein alteration, and that means beta lactams are not going to work as well. So this ends up being the highest yield concept, and that is related to MRSA and how MRSA came about. The USMLE loves for you to know the pathophysiology of MRSA. So what does the MECA gene encode? Well, it encodes this penicillin binding protein 2A. And this is a modified penicillin binding protein, which makes beta-lactam binding very weak. Remember, beta-lactams bound to penicillin binding protein subsequently inhibited your cross-linking, and thus you don't get a nice peptidoglycan membrane. And so when you have this MECA gene, that then confers this penicillin binding protein 2A and an altered penicillin binding protein, just put this into your mind, is the basis behind MRSA. Remember, MRSA stands for methicillin resistant staph aureus. And so here's your methicillin. And when you have the PBP2A, which is encoded by this gene, you have methicillin resistance. So let's go through this pathophysiology in a little bit of a graphical way. You have this alteration in penicillin binding protein, i.e. a production of PBP2A that inhibits beta-lactam binding. For example, methicillin is going to now not be able to bind in its normal place, and thus you get methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Very high yield for us to know. And what we do now kind of integrate is what we use for MRSA, and that is vancomycin because vancomycin doesn't bind to penicillin binding protein. No way. Vancomycin blocks the D-ala, D-ala bonds in the actual formation of the peptidoglycan cell wall. So it, vancomycin doesn't use PBP. It actually uses an alternative pathway, which is the D-ala, D-ala, which again is a component of the peptidoglycan cell wall. All right. So we went through penicillins, we went through your ampicillin, amoxicillin, and we talked about beta-lactamase inhibitors. And then we talked about beta-lactamase resistant penicillin, which is your methicillin, oxicillin, decloxicillin, nafcillin. And we recognize that these beta-lactamase resistant penicillins, remember methicillin was actually the types of penicillins that got altered when we talked about MRSA and the altered penicillin binding protein. Finally, what we're going to be covering is the anti-pseudomonal penicillins. And this is going to be your piperacillin and ticarcillin. And remember, we talked about piperacillin being conjugated with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, which was tazobactam. So piperacillin, tazobactam, what medication is that that we use commonly in clinical practice? Just as a space repetition, go ahead and put that into the chat. Awesome. People are saying Zosin, and you're absolutely correct. Stay engaged. Piperacillin plus Dazobactam equals Zosin. It's an anti pseudomonal penicillin. Let's go ahead and go through this. A patient presents with severe ear pain. He has pain on manipulation of the trichus. So anytime you're contorting the ear, ow! The otic canal is erythematous. Tympanic membranes are clear. So this is not otitis media. What are the characteristics of the likely etiology? A, comma-shaped rod. B, fast lactose fermenter. C, modal and oxidase positive. D, requires X and V for growth. E, non-modal and H2S producing. What do you all think is the answer here? Awesome. We're getting a lot of answers. People are saying C and that is absolutely correct because what are we thinking about here, guys? Well, this is going to be otitis 
externa related to pseudomonas. All right. So let's go through some of the most important vignettes that you're going to see on test day related to pseudomonas. But before I go into this, I think this is a good time for me to check in. Are you guys learning and having fun? Go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. You guys learning, having fun? Awesome. Mini, Nana, Faraz, Santiago, Pias. Wow, we have so many people here. I am pumped to keep going. Let's do it. All right. A patient with cystic fibrosis plus a focal lung finding. Remember, patients with cystic fibrosis are going to be very prone to pseudomonal pneumonias or pseudomonal colonization. You also want to be thinking about pseudomonas in ventilator-associated pneumonia, which is going to be a hospital-acquired pneumonia. And that hospital-acquired pneumonia is actually really important for us to recognize because now the USMLE is shifting into these practice-based learning or how a hospital works. And those types of questions are going to be related to, oh, what are the infections that happen in the hospital setting? And so MRSA infections by asymptomatic carriers. Remember, where does MRSA stay? That stays in the nares. And then you're going to be thinking about ventilator-associated pneumonias. And that is going to be a patient who's in the ICU has a breathing tube in, and then subsequently in the next few days, you see a new infiltrate on the chest x-ray and you're going to be like, hmm, what is that? Well, that is going to be a pseudomonal ventilator associated pneumonia. How about this one? A patient with burn or who is neutropenic, who is a very immunocompromised host and now has a skin rash. What are you thinking of here? Yes, pseudomonas again, but in particular, the test question related to ecthyma gangrenosum. A patient who is in a pool and now has ear pain with tragus manipulation. We talked about that. And that is otitis externa. And then finally, a patient who was on a honeymoon in a hot tub and now has a skin rash on the chest. You're going to be thinking of hot tub folliculitis. Remember that Pseudomonas loves this arid, wet, moist type of environment. And so that's why patients with diabetes who, for example, have a uh, rusty nail that they step on or some sort of foot ulcer, you're going to be thinking of that green nail syndrome, which is also going to be related to pseudomonas. So what are some key rapid review facts on pseudomonas? Well, pseudomonas is modal. It's aerobic. It's a gram negative rod. Remember gram negatives have lipopolysaccharide. That's high yield for us to know. It is oxidase positive which we talked about in our last question, as well as it gives you this grape-like odor, pyocyanin pigment. It's non-lactose fermenting and it inactivates elongation factor two. And so how the USMLE can actually test this is that it inactivates your translation because EF2 is going to be related to translation. And so that brings us to key bacterial virulence mechanisms. Again, I want to integrate the actual microbiology for test day as well. And so let's go through some key concepts here. Bacteria can cause virulence by inhibiting protein synthesis. And we talked about inactivation of elongation factor two related to pseudomonas, but remember that your diphtheria can do that as well. Watch for that um, unimmunized patient who has upper airway obstruction and leathery tonsils. Another virulence mechanism is related to modulating the 60S ribosomal subunit. And remember, the shiga toxin can do that. And that's going to be seen in EHEC, which is enterohemorrhagic E. coli, as well as shigella, because both of them have the shiga toxin. And the shiga toxin inhibits 60S. And again, that inhibits protein synthesis. Now, bacteria can also modulate cyclic AMP in the body. And you can get high adenylate cyclase activity. And remember, these are all related to the GS, GPCR pathway. And so what are going to be important agents? Well, you're going to have the heat labile enterotoxigenic E. coli, which is traveler's diarrhea. Anthrax can cause this as well as cholera. And remember, high adenylate cyclase activity 
related to cholera gives you that voluminous rice water diarrhea. And that is due to the fact that high adenylate cyclase activity activates chloride channels within the actual gut and more chloride within the gut causes you to have water that comes with it as well. And thus you get that very watery diarrhea as chloride is going to draw that water into the lumen of the bowel and then cause diarrhea. And then finally, you have bacteria that are going to inhibit neurotransmitter release. Now, it depends on what kind of neuron you're talking about. Is it an activating neuron or an inhibitory neuron? And so essentially, the broad picture concept here is the fact that bacteria are going to modulate the snare proteins. And the snare proteins are important for causing your vesicle to actually fuse to the presynaptic membrane. And this is going to be implicated in your Clostridium botulinum infection, in which you are going to get snare inhibition and a floppy, floppy, hypotonic, lower motor neuron baby, as well as tetanospasm, in which you still get that snare inhibition, but it's of a inhibitory neuron, snare inhibition of an inhibitory neuron. And so that causes what? That causes a disinhibition. And downstream, you get the, you get the trismus, you get the tetany, you get the hypertonia. So both botulism and tetanus are going to be related to snare. However, one is going to be related to a actual neuromuscular synapse, whereas the other one is going to be related to neurons that are normally inhibitory. All of these bacterial and virulence mechanisms are usually going to be these AB toxin. And that is essentially exotoxin in which the A component is the active component and the B component binds. But what I want you to know is that exotoxin is actually going to be different than endotoxin. Endotoxin, that's lipopolysaccharide. Endotoxin, that is going to be seen in gram-negative bacteria. And so what's important for us to recognize is that gram-negative bacteria have lipopolysaccharide, and it is this lipopolysaccharide that is known as also endotoxin. And remember that the lipid A portion is the most antigenic of lipopolysaccharide. And what that does is that tells the innate immune response to upregulate IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. And that's actually really high yield for us to know because then these acute phase cytokines, there's your USMLE immunology tie-in. These cytokines cause you to have vasodilation of your actual arterioles. You get a decrease in systemic vascular resistance, and that is the basis for septic shock. Mic drop, guys. This is how you're supposed to learn medicine. We want to take antimicrobials related to microbiology, then put in the pathophysiology, the diseases, because this is how these new NBMEs especially are testing these concepts. All right, so let's go ahead and summarize penicillins. When you're thinking about the beta-lactam spectrum, you're going to be thinking about penicillins, which is penicillin G and penicillin V. You have the beta-lactamase sensitive penicillins, which is your amoxicillin and ampicillin. We have the beta-lactamase resistant penicillins, which is your methicillin, NAF, ox, clox, declox. And then finally, your anti-pseudomonal penicillins, which are piperacillin, ticarcillin. Now, the next concept we have to talk about are the cephalosporins. Let's go ahead and go into this question. A patient is diagnosed with meningitis. Ceftriaxone is administered. A research study isolates the disease-causing bacteria and incubates the bacteria with ceftriaxone. A radial label is added. The radial label will be bound to which of the following structures? A, DNA, B, porins, C, ribosomal proteins, or D, transpeptidases. What do you guys think is the answer here? Go ahead and put that into the chat. Hmm. And if you said D, you're absolutely correct because what I'm trying to go for here is the fact that penicillins and cephalosporins both share the beta-lactam ring. And guys, this is an innovative way to learn.
right? So now what we're doing is we're saying, all right, let, we went through the classic beta, beta lactams. Now let's go through some beta lactam derivatives and cephalosporins are one of them. So let's go through the reverse pyramid model. How do we learn cephalosporins for the USMLA? Well, obviously cephalosporins, just like penicillins, inhibit cell wall of bacteria. And these cephalosporins are relative res relatively resistant to beta lactamases. The mechanism of action is the same as the beta lactams or the penicillins we talked about prior. And what we know are that these cephalosporins have different classes, which we'll cover in the next slide. And then finally, you can get cross reactivity with penicillins. For example, if you have a true type one hypersensitivity reaction to beta lactams or penicillins, that can subsequently make you allergic to cephalosporins because again, there's that same beta lactam ring. Cephalosporins also can cause autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And so you give a cephalosporin and then you have a test question related to low haptoglobin and Coombs positive, bam, you're thinking about autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And just as a 260 question right here, cephalosporins can cause vitamin K deficiency. So what we have to recognize are these facts. And these are the four facts that I want you to take away for, with regards to cephalosporins. If you don't remember anything else, just know this. These are the highest yield facts that come up in the question banks, as well as on your NBME practice exams. Ceftriaxone crosses the blood brain barrier and causes meningitis. Ceftazidine is a third generation cephalosporin and it covers pseudomonas. It's the only third generation cephalosporin that covers pseudomonas. Cefepime is a fourth generation cephalosporin that covers pseudomonas. Ceftaraline is a fifth generation cephalosporin that tears it up with coverage of MRSA and the fact that cephalosporins, like I said, are relatively beta lactamase resistant. Ladies and gentlemen, remember that there is no antibiotic currently that covers both pseudomonas and MRSA. So that's why you have to use two agents. But the cephalosporins as a class covers pseudomonas thanks to ceftazidime and cefepime. And it also covers MRSA thanks to ceftaroline. But does ceftaroline cover pseudomonas? And the answer is no. Ceftaroline does not cover pseudomonas. It covers MRSA. So let's go through the cephalosporins, guys. First generation cephalosporin, cephalexin and cefazolin. Second generation, fur, fox, fac, cefuroxine, cefoxetine, and cefaclor, fur, fox, fac. Third generation, you have your ceftriaxone, you have your cefotaxine, and then you have ceftazidine. And what was key about ceftazidine, everybody? It covers pseudomonas. And then finally, you have your fourth generation, cefepine, and fifth generation, ceftaroline. And what's important about ceftaroline, everyone? It covers MRSA. So let's go through the vignettes that you need to know. A patient who is going into surgery and will need to have pre-operation prophylaxis. Remember, pre-operation prophylaxis, you're trying to cover your skin agents, i.e. MSSA. And so you typically use IV cefazolin. And remember that cefazolin is a first-generation cephalosporin that covers perioperative wound infections, as well as MSSA skin and soft tissue infections, but cefazolin has no activity against MRSA. A patient who has stiff neck plus fever, or a patient who has cervical motion tenderness or purulence from the vaginal region, you're going to be thinking about ceftriaxone, because in this case, ceftriaxone covers Neisseria meningitidis. It also covers what else? Strep pneumo that causes your meningitis. And then this one is going to be your Neisseria gonorrhea, in which you are going to be thinking of pelvic inflammatory disease. So the key points here is that ceftriaxone is good for the blood-brain barrier. If you're going to have a patient who has pelvic inflammatory disease, we typically cu couple our ceftriaxone with the zithromycin to cover chlamydial infections. This is a very unique point in the sense that your ceftriaxone, especially in neonates, is going to cause you to dissociate albumin from bilirubin. And so if that happens, that bilirubin can then go into the brain and deposit in the basal ganglia. And in little neonates, 
can cause kernicterus. And then ceftazidine is the only third generation cephalosporin that covers pseudomonas. Damn, use a dime. You're covering pseudomonas. A patient who was on chemotherapy has low ANC and now has a fever. Ladies and gentlemen, let me go ahead and get your participation here. Is this patient in this mini vignette, is this patient immunocompetent or immunocompromised? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Immunocompetent or immunocompromised? All right. Everybody should be participating. This is not a passive session. You have to put in the same energy that I'm putting in. Here we go. You're absolutely correct. It's immunocompromised. And so in these immunocompromised patients, you want to cover pseudomonas and MRSA. And in particular, you are going to be very, very scared of pseudomonal infections. And that's why we use cefepime. Cefepime covers pseudomonas. We typically couple cefepime with vancomycin. Remember, vancomycin covers the MRSA that we're worried about. And this is a broad spectrum therapy. Just like Piperacil and Tazobactam, there's your space repetition. Let's go ahead and go into broad spectrum antibiotics. Let's talk about this vignette. A 55-year-old male is admitted for acute myelogenous leukemia. He is noted to have a low leukocyte count. On day two of admission, he is febrile, hypotensive, and tachycardic. So guys, he's in septic shock. Put that in your mind. He's immunocompromised and has septic shock. A skin rash develops and is pictured. Broad spectrum antibiotics are initiated. Which of the following organisms is most likely responsible for these patient symptoms? E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Strep pyogenes, or H. flu. What do you all think? Go ahead and put the answer into the chat box. You guys need to stick with me until the end. This is quite the workout, and it's an integrative way of learning. Go ahead. If you haven't participated, what do you think is the answer? This is an immunocompromised patient who has septic shock and these skin lesions, which is ectima gangrenosum, and that is related to pseudomonas. Very good. Excellent. So when we're thinking about broad spectrum antibiotic therapy, we want to cover scary, scary organisms. And the two scary organisms that I've been mentioning are MRSA and pseudomonas. Now remember, how did MRSA come about? Modified penicillin binding protein. That's going to be exceedingly high yield for us to know. And for your hospital type or uh, ethics and stuff uh, type of questions, you prevent MRSA by disinfection. Okay, you prevent MRSA by disinfecting surfaces, et cetera. And for MRSA, we typically use vancomycin. Pseudomonas, we talked about, has that lipopolysaccharide, which is endotoxin, and pseudomonas is gram negative. And we use broad spectrum antibiotics like Piperacil and Tazobactam, which is known as Zosin. And so typically in the clinical setting, you will see Vanc and Zosin employed. This is a very high yield slide, and this kind of covers what antibiotics cover MRSA and what antibiotics cover pseudomonas. Remember, there's not an antibiotic that covers both. So right now, just to make sure that you are paying attention, go ahead and type into the chat, what is an antibiotic that covers pseudomonas? Go ahead and put that into the chat. What do you think is an antibiotic that covers pseudomonas? Name any of them. Name any of them. Okay, people are saying Piperacil and Tazobactam. People are saying Cefepime. People are saying Ceftazidine. So when it comes to MRSA, we use vancomycin. We use clindamycin, which is good for MRSA as well as anaerobes. We use linazolid. We use ceftaroline, which is your fifth generation cephalosporin. And then we use trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. For pseudomonal infections, we use Piperacil and Tazobactam, which we talked about is Zosin. Ceftazidine, which is what generation of cephalosporin? Go ahead and put that in the chat. It's just a single number. Go ahead and put in what generation is ceftazidine? Good. It's going to be third generation with ceftriaxone, but ceftazidine is the only one that covers pseudomonas. You have cefepime. You're going to be talking about your penems like carbapenem. Ciprofloxacin does, as well as your aminoglycosides, which we'll talk about. But that is going to be related to gentamicin, neomycin, amicacin, and tobramycin. So the key test-taking tip, guys, is to make sure that in your questions, you're always paying attention to immunocompromised hosts. 
The USMLE clues related to immunocompromised hosts and subsequently them being prone to MRSA, pseudomonas, for example, are going to be in your test question. They'll put, oh, the patient has HIV. The patient is an oncology patient, has diabetes, has lupus, and is on chronic steroids or tacrolimus therapy, just got a bone marrow transplant or solid organs. What you have to do is you have to isolate immunocompromised hosts. So the name of the game is not only the microbe, which Sketch is great at teaching, but it's also integrating in your vignette. That's the test-taking strategy of which patients are relatively very immunocompromised and susceptible to pseudomonal MRSA infections. So let's go ahead and do an antibiotic rapid review. I appreciate you all sticking around with me. What penicillin is anti-pseudomonal? Go ahead and put that into the chat box. What penicillin is anti-pseudomonal? And we are seeing piperacillin and ticarcillin. You're absolutely correct. Which third, cephalospor third generation cephalosporin can cross the blood-brain barrier? That's going to be your ceftriaxone. Which one covers pseudomonas? That's your ceftazidine. And which penicillins are stable against beta-lactamase? That's going to be methicillin, oxacillin, cloxacillin, decloxacillin. And what are your beta-lactamase inhibitors? That's going to be clavulinic, sulbactam, and tazobactam. Ladies and gentlemen, even for the review in May, we're going to be covering pharmacology like this, and we are going to be having these intermittent rapid reviews so you get that space repetition during the lecture itself. So now we have our last portion of what we're going to be covering, and we're going to be shifting gears and talking a little bit about the antibiotics that inhibit translation. And those are going to be the antibiotics that are going to modulate or inhibit the 30S and the 50S ribosomal subunit. A 20-year-old previously healthy male comes to the emergency department with fever, malaise, and persistent non-productive cough. He has mild pharyngeal erythema. Chest x-ray shows patchy interstitial infiltrates. Sputum stain shows numerous leukocytes, but no organisms. A beta-lactamase medication, or excuse me, a beta-lactam medication, is considered, however, is noted to be ineffective in the treatment of this patient's condition. Which of the following best explains the likely etiology by which penicillins may not be effective in treating this patient's microbiological agent? So this is the presentation of walking pneumonia, interstitial pneumonia, and we notice that mycoplasma does not have a very big peptidoglycan cell wall. And in fact, the cell wall is made up of cholesterol. And remember, that's why your penicillins and beta-lactams are ineffective. So what do we use? Well, we use protein synthesis inhibitors, and that's going to be our next topic. Now, guys, I love this mnemonic because it reminds me of how to play the stock market well. Buy at 30, so you buy low, sell at 50. So let's go through buy at 30. When you're thinking about the AT, the 30S inhibitors are your amino glycosides as well as your tetracyclines. And then the sell at 50, sell high, you're going to be thinking of chloramphenicol, clindamycin, erythromycin, which is going to be a macrolide, and lincomycin, which is not as high yield, but linazolid is. Let's go ahead and parse through this mnemonic. I made it visually for you as well. So buy at 30, sell at 50. Aminoglycosides and tetracyclines are going to affect the 30S, whereas chloramphenicol, clindamycin, erythromycin, which is a macrolide, and then linazolid. Just as we integrate cell biology, Remember that in prokaryotes, we get the 50S and the 30S, and together they make the 70S. And that's different than eukaryotes. Let's go ahead and go through the 30S inhibitors. We have our aminoglycosides. The aminoglycosides, because they are going to inhibit 30S, they inhibit translation. That's the big picture. The mechanism of action is the fact that they specifically inhibit misreading of mRNA. Aminoglycosides 
aminoglycoslides. Whoops, I missed it. The specific names are going to be the gnats. Mean gnats, those little flies. Gentamicin, neomycin, amicacin, tobramycin. And remember that they are going to be very nephrotoxic. And so look, this is how the USMLA goes for it. They put high creatinine or they are ototoxic as well. And so you can get an abnormal Rene test, i.e. sensorineural hearing loss. The pathology vignettes that are associated with aminoglycosides are going to be those cystic fibrosis patients who have pneumonia, because remember, aminoglycosides cover pseudomonas. Fever and sepsis in neonate, remember, you want to cover GPS and E. coli with gentamicin, for example. And then eye infections, you can use tobramycin drops, for example. So the mnemonic for aminoglycosides are mean NATS, gentamicin, neomycin, amicacin, tobramycin. By at 30, so tetracyclines is next, they inhibit translation and they inhibit the 30S subunit, but in particular, they prevent the attachment of amino acyl tRNA to the A site. Remember, the tRNA gets charged and then it goes to the A site during your translation. And so the bacteria are going to definitely die if you don't have that initial process of the amino acyl tRNA binding to the A site. Specific names for tetracyclines are going to be tetracycline and doxycycline. And remember that when you're talking about tetracyclines, they are teratogenic, so don't use them in pregnancy, and they can cause teeth discoloration. What are some pathophysiology tie-ins here? Well, remember that tick-borne diseases, we typically are going to be using doxycycline. And a lot of tick-borne diseases not only have the travel history and the location in the world that these ticks are going to come from, but majority of arbor arthropod born diseases are going to have headache in the symptomatology in your vignette. We use tetracyclines for H. pylori. So think about it when you see gastritis or ulcers in your vignettes, and you can use tetracyclines for chlamydial infections, as well as for atypical mycoplasma or atypical pneumonias. So we talked about aminoglycosides and tetracyclines. Now we are finishing off the session talking about chloramphenicol, clindamycin, erythromycin, which are your macrolides, and linazolid. Let's go through this. And that's your 50S subunits. And what's the mnemonic? Cell high, cell at 50. Chloramphenicol is going to inhibit translation. It inhibits specifically the peptidyl transferase reaction. And we use chloramphenicol in patients who are going to have meningitis in third world countries. But what is exceedingly high yield is that chloramphenicol after administered can cause an ashen gray, kind of Smurf-like skin, but this gray baby syndrome. And this is going to be related similar to amiodarone. Remember amiodarone is a third class three, excuse me, antiarrhythmic. Clindamycin is also part of the cell at 50. Clindamycin inhibits translation. It inhibits the translocation, so going from A to P to E, and clindamycin is associated with C. diff. So the pathophysiology tie-in or the vignettes that are high yield are the fact that, hey, if a patient gets an antibiotic and then gets watery diarrhea, think about C. diff infection related to clindamycin. And remember that clindamycin is really, really, really good for not only pseudomonas, but most importantly, anaerobic infection. So somebody who has aspiration risk, so your patients with dementia, who had a stroke, alcoholics, and then bam, they get an aspiration pneumonia, you're going to be thinking about clindamycin. So a 23-year-old female presents with vaginal discharge. Discharge is noted to have an odor, non-purulent, thin in consistency, and gray in color. You have no dysuria or hematuria. She was recently treated for pneumonia, a diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis is made, and metronidazole therapy is initiated. Which of the following best describes the mechanism of action of metronidazole? Go ahead and put it in the chat. We have people already putting it in the chat, even while I'm reading it. That's amazing. You're absolutely correct. Metronidazole causes free radical formation. I posted this on Instagram, but I want you guys to recognize that metronidazole, along with clindamycin, are good for anaerobic infections. Metronidazole, you're going to be thinking about using it in Giardia infections, Entamoeba infections, Trichomonas infections, 
You're going to be thinking about using it in your Gardnella, which causes your bacterial vaginosis, as well as other agents. And remember, the high yield side effect is going to be that reaction with alcohol use. So why I put this in is both clindamycin and metronidazole cover anaerobes. And we typically say that clindamycin use above the diaphragm. So your aspiration pneumonias, where you take your oral anaerobes and bam, you get an aspiration pneumonia, you're going to use clindamycin for anaerobes above the diaphragm. And for your pelvic abscesses, for example, or your gut infections, anaerobic infections of the gut and the pelvis, you're going to be thinking of metronidazole. All right. Going back and just finishing up macrolides and linazolid. So macrolides, they are going to inhibit 50S. And in particular, they're going to block the translocation. And that is that 23S rRNA. That's the specific area that macrolides are going to affect. Now, macrolides are going to be your thromycins, erythromycin, azithromycin, clarithromycin. And the side effects are going to be the fact that macrolides are going to have a promotilin type of activity in which you get increased gut peristalsis. Use in very small babies can predispose them to pyloric stenosis. And your macrolides, like azithromycin, are QTC prolonging. What we also have to recognize is that macrolides are good for these type of vignettes fever plus an atypical pneumonia. Remember, we talked about mycoplasma and we use azithromycin for the mycoplasma infections. A patient who is unimmunized, but then has, <coughs> you're going to be thinking about bordetella pertussis. And remember, bordetella pertussis is a microbiological bacteria that causes a lymphocytosis. I think you need to know that. And then finally, you're going to be thinking about using macrolides in patients who have diphtherial infections. So the mnemonic that I like to use to remember that your throw mycins or macrolides are, hey, throw things on the MacBook. Throw on the MacBook. Okay, got it. So erythromycin, azithromycin, and clarithromycin are your macrolides. All right, wrapping up, guys, linazolid. Linazolid blocks the 50S and blocks the line of protein synthesis. It blocks that initiation, 50S and 30S coming together. It causes bone marrow suppression and linazolid, we talked about it prior, covers MRSA. What I also want to do is take this same mnemonic and kind of modulate it a little bit and go through basic micro or basic, excuse me, biochemistry. And that is integrating it with the process of translation. So remember, inhibition of tRNA to three prime CCA tail for charging. Remember, that's that initial charging step, the binding. That's going to be your tetracyclines. They inhibit that tRNA. What about the inhibition of the 30S and the 50S coming together? You're going to be thinking about linazolid. And then inhibition of binding to the A site in particular, that's going to be your amino glycosides, causing that misreading. Inhibition of peptidyl transferase, you're going to be thinking about chloramphenicol, so getting from one site to the next inhibiting translocation in just a slightly different way. That's going to be your macrolides. And inhibiting translocation is also going to be the key feature of clindamycin. So yet just another way for you to approach the material. We are going to end by talking about how bacteria and antibiotics are going to have that resistance interaction. So what I like to do is I like to say that know the antibiotic mechanism, because if you know the antibiotic mechanism, then knowing the resistance mechanism is very, very easy. Because when you know the target of your antibiotic and you just say, oh, it's a mutated target, swerve, that's what gives you resistance. So don't memorize the resistance from the get-go, just know the mechanism of action and altering the actual target of the medication gives you that antimicrobial resistance. So for example, penicillin resistance, we talked about beta lactamase production from bacteria. We talked about the fact that the beta lactamase are going to cleave the beta lactam ring of, antibiot of the antibiotics and the bacteria then is going to win. There's something called a extended spectrum 
beta lactamase. And that's via plasmid conjugation. Gram negatives like E. coli and Klebsiella can give you that extended spectrum beta lactamases. But this is just one way we've already covered in which bacteria can cause resistance to the antibiotics. Another way is going to be that mutation in PBP, which we talked about with MRSA. And then finally, we're going to be talking about vancomycin resistance, in which vancomycin, typically the MOA of vancomycin is diala diala binding, preventing peptidoglycan assembly. But in the case of enterococcus, for example, some strains of enterococcus can go diala diala to diala lack, i.e. altering the target swerve, altering the target of vancomycin, and thus conferring resistance. Remember that vancomycin has a very high yield side effect. And that is if you give vancomycin and they put, oh, the patient now is flushing, itching. You're going to be thinking about a mast cell, local, small mast cell response called red man syndrome. And vancomycin, just like your amino glycosides, are nephrotoxic. So watch for the high creatinine. So fluoroquinolones. We haven't talked about them formally, but remember that fluoroquinolones inhibit DNA gyrase or topoisomerase, and thus you get more bacterial tension and the DNA then whoop, breaks. And so the resistance is, look, mutation in the target, the mutation in DNA gyrase. You also are going to be thinking of efflux pumps for both tetracyclines and your fluoroquinolones. Aminoglycosides, we, we said that by AT30, they cause the misreading of mRNA. You get bad protein synthesis. And remember that bacteria can cause you to acetylate, phosphorylate, or adenylate aminoglycosides, and thus you get resistance. Lastly, we'll talk about antibiotics and pregnancy. Remember that in patients who are going to be pregnant and who are going to have E. coli in their urine, you're going to always treat asymptomatic bacteriuria in pregnancy. And that's high yield for us to know because asymptomatic bacteriuria in pregnancy needs to be treated so it doesn't ascend and it doesn't infect the baby. So here are the antibiotics you got to know in pregnancy and the mechanism of action. Nitrofurantoin causes reactive oxygen species, just like metronidazole. Cephalexin, just so that you're paying attention, what generation of cephalosporin is cephalexin? Go ahead and put that in the chat. People are going nuts. Here we go. We got it. That's going to be first generation cephalosporin, amoxicillin, and astreonam, which actually inhibits a special type of penicillin binding protein, which is penicillin binding protein three. We talked about in review, cystitis versus pyelonephritis. The fact that pyelonephritis is going to be cystitis on steroids, i.e. you get fever and the CVA tenderness, very high yield for us to know in your vignettes. And that brings us to the end of today's session. I'm just going to summarize some test-taking strategies for you. And that is that if you see a pharmacological agent within a test question, bam, recall the mechanism of action. Vancomycin is initiated. Okay, vancomycin, diala, diala, bam. The other test-taking point that I want you to know is for us to learn pharmacology in that reverse pyramid approach, integrating it with pathophysiology. And then finally, as you're going through pharmacology for the USMLE, understand not only the microbe, which is what Sketchy does, but understand the host, immunocompromised host, you get immunocompromised infection, and then you relate it to the clinical disease. Ladies and gentlemen, I have such a special announcement for you all. If you like the way that we went through the high yield USMLE information, then I really think you'll like my May 15th and May 16th rapid review pharmacology course right now in the chat box. I am going to be placing the link as well as the curriculum. Click on it. See if it's going to be right for you. We're going to be going through a lot of drug mechanisms, because the USMLE is now starting to test the drug mechanisms, we're going to go through the highest yield pharmacological agents. And I want you all to know that if you sign up, you're also going to be getting my high yield notion 
study guide that has all of the antimicrobials and all of the pharmacological agents in one place. Guys, in this webinar, in May 15th and 16th, we're going to cover sketchy stuff and pathoma stuff, put them together into one for your high yield test preparation, high yield review. So I would encourage you to sign up for this review. I'm going to stop here. And if you have any questions, I'm going to be sticking around 